Here's another bonus episode. Let's roll. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. From the Broken Time studio right here in Hayden, Idaho, this is Jim Huntsman, your host. Welcome to this episode of the show. Thank you guys for tuning in. So glad you're here, and I'm really looking forward to doing this because I've been I've been kind of thinking about doing this kind of episode for a long time, and uh, this is a bonus episode. And so what I've done here, guys, is I've been getting tons and tons and tons of like emails and messages about yeah from people that are either brand new hunters or they've never hunted at all. And so this is this is who we're going to be talking to in this episode. This is a how to become a hunter if you are basically a total rookie, never done it, never been in the field, or maybe you've been out um, you know a couple years and and just want to get better. So for for you seasoned hunters out there, this one might not be the best episode for you, but if you listen to it, it might be good for you to uh, you know give it a listen and then jump on our Facebook group. For those of you that are not in the Facebook group, that is Hunting the West dash the Western Huntsman. Uh, come join us over there. There's a lot of good discussions that take place over there. But if you if you are a seasoned hunter and you listen to this episode and you have some feedback or something you'd like to add, that would be a really good place to uh, add that information. So, okay, going back, getting back to this. Again, guys, this is going to be a on uh, how to become a hunter. And and I mean in a practical way, not not the, you know, real surface level stuff that doesn't get into the nitty-gritty of what you need to focus on to become a proficient hunter. This is this is going to be uh, somewhat detailed out as to, you know, what you need to learn, what you need to focus on and and how to become this isn't this isn't how to go hunt an elk. This is how to learn to go hunt an elk, okay? And that's a that's a big difference. This isn't how to, you know, learn how to call a turkey. This is how to learn to go hunting. This is how to learn. You've never been. Uh, maybe you have been exposed to it here and there, but you've just never gotten into it. Or maybe you've had nothing to do with hunting ever in your life, but all of a sudden something hits you. Maybe you're one of those uh, younger folks out there that are getting into hunting or interested in hunting because of the the health benefits to both the activity of hunting and the wild game meat. Because there are um, a, there's a lot of data out there that suggests that if you're seeking a, a healthy lifestyle, this is the way to do it. That is not how I got into it, but I sure do enjoy that aspect of it. And so um, that that's who we're talking to. You, you folks out there that are just brand new, you want to get into it. You want to have this new passion and and buckle up. I'm, I'm warning you right now. Once the bug is in you, it will never go away. And so that's what this episode is about. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. If you're new to this show, welcome to the Western Huntsman. The Western Huntsman is not my name. It's not my nickname. I'm Jim Huntsman. The Western Huntsman is a brand, and and if you listen to this show, you you become a part of it. Uh, the Team Western Huntsman. Uh, we use that hashtag on on social media, Team Western Huntsman, because we're all in this together. We have a miss mission, and and here at the Western Huntsman, the the mission is very specific. It's to inspire a genuine passion for hunting, fishing, and conservation, to develop a strong coalition of American outdoorsmen willing to fight and protect our hunting rights, public lands access, and our wildlife. And those are important things. If you are going to be a hunter, you must be a good steward of these things that I mentioned, hunting rights, public lands, our access, wildlife. Uh, yeah, the, this is, it's a responsibility. It's a responsibility of all hunters to protect it. So as you are kind of dabbing or dipping your toes into the, the hunting, uh, the, the world of hunting, keep those things in mind because really those are the most important things. So here at the Western Huntsman, we talk about that and we talk about hunting. We have tips, we have tactics, we have strategies and, and just hunting conversations 
that we all really enjoy and and uh, we we get to know each other we learn a lot and and that's the point of this it's a community of hunters that hunt the west and uh so again if you're brand new welcome welcome to this wild ride so let's kick this off so you new hunters out there um there, there's a few things that you need to focus on you, you, first of all i want you to uh, when you're like on social media or, or watching some of these YouTube videos or some of the hunting channels on TV, uh, there's a lot of marketing involved in hunting. Okay. I want you to take that marketing and just pull it out of your, your, your mind. Like if your mind was a box and it's the, the, the box is full of a bunch of parts and, and one of those parts is the marketing, take that out of the box for a minute and just set it aside. You don't need to worry about the marketing aspect of it. It'll it'll suck you down paths that will take your eye off the prize. So take all that out. And we're, we're going to focus on the things that are there. I, basically, I look at it like this. There's three things. It's like a three-prong approach that you as a new hunter should really focus on. And, and these are very important. And not one of them is more important than the other. They are all equally as important as each other. And those three things are the education, the mentorship, and the time in the field, okay? And we're going to break those down. Let's start with the education. Educating yourself uh, to become a good hunter or, or competent in the field is ne- it's never been easier than it is now. Like, there are so many resources out there. This being one of them, the Western Huntsman podcast. Uh, and there, so the point being that there, there's just a ton of information. There's a ton of resources. Much of it is free. If you want to get real crazy, you can pay for even extra resources. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute, but educate and mentorship and time in the field and mentorship is going to be something probably that you've not heard anywhere else in terms of how I'm going to lay that out, because I think that that's a broad term and there's a lot of misguided information out there as to what mentorship, uh, really is for a new hunter. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, time in the field, guys, I, I'm going to, I'm going to pound this one home. The, the there is not going to be anything out there that will teach you to be a good hunter faster and more proficiently than you being in the field. So before you go buy a bunch of hunting gear, when you've never been hunting, you need to focus on these three things first. And I tell you, when I first began hunting by myself, I was still a teenager and I had gone out several times with dads and uncles and family friends and, and things like that, right, when I was a kid. But as I started branching out on my own as a teenager, uh, I was going incredible incredible distances into the mountains of the West. I was going further than many people even go now at 14, 15 years old. And I was doing this with freaking Nike tennis shoes and Levi's. So my point to that is not to suggest that you don't need hunting gear. It's that that should not be your initial priority, okay? As, as we're getting into this, put the gear aside, and we'll talk about gear as we wrap this conversation up. It's kind of part of that thing in the box that's, that's labeled marketing, right? Just put the gear aside for a minute. Okay, let's let's turn to uh, the, the, the three, three-prong approach that I just mentioned here. I got the notes pulled up. Um, and let's see, pull the, there we go. Now I can read them. I'm getting old. I got to like enhance the screen here so I can read my own notes. <laughs> All right. Educate mentorship and time in the field. <clears throat> this is my three prong approach for you guys. Uh, you guys and gals that are just getting into hunting education. So here's some resources. Um, actually before I do that, education needs to be a two part kind of process. Okay. So, so we're going to break that down into two different aspects. When you're educating yourself about hunting, you you need to focus on two things. One being how to hunt, but more importantly, learning the wild game. When we're talking about learning about your wild game and, and the game that you're, you're wanting to pursue. And I don't care if it's waterfowl. I don't care if it's elk. I don't care if it's deer. I don't care if it's rabbits. You need to know those animals. You need to know their behavior, their food sources, migrations, uh, breeding seasons, kind of those, what what was that, four things? I think that, yeah, four things is what I put in the notes here. That's going to be your four main things that you need to know about the animals in order to be effective at hunting them. You need to know their behavior. You you really do need to know their behavior. Uh, You need to know the food sources. You need to know migrations. 
Migration is going to be really important, for example, if you're hunting mule deer in the late season. Uh, this is going to help you locate deer. Uh, same thing with like waterfowl or, or anything like that. Breeding seasons. Breeding seasons are super important to understand and knowing like the behavior of each game species during these breeding seasons. And how do you learn that? I mean, there's there's a ton of information out there. The, the point is this. I, I'm not going to sit here and talk to you about each species uh, and their behavior traits, right? My my goal here is to teach you that you need to learn behavior, and there is a ton of resources out there and knowledge on the, each game species out there. There's there's people that specialize just in turkeys on Instagram that you could follow. There's people that write blogs about deer behavior. There's websites about studies of elk and mule deer, and and these um, if you go to like a lot of these universities. They'll have these website, the ecological or um, animal behavioralist, that, you know, all these different all these different programs that they offer at these universities. They'll post all this information and the studies that they put up. Some of them get way in depth. And if you want to geek out on that, I would encourage it. If you don't want to go that in depth, you don't really need to. You just need to kind of know the basics. A lot of the books that I recommend, I, I do like, there's a book called North American Elk Ecology and Management. It's a little difficult to find. Uh, but if you're interested in elk, that is a book you must have. If you're a if, if you're looking to get into mule deer hunting, learning about mule deer and their behaviors and what they eat and how they migrate and all the, these things, there's a book called Mule Deer Country, and it was written by Dr. Valerius Geist, uh, who is one of the authors of the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation. So obviously he's got uh, a pretty credible leg to stand on when uh, when we're talking about mule deer and other species. He's also got one called Elk Country, and he's got one on antelope. Or, or I'm sorry, pronghorn. Um, he's he's got one on goat. Uh, I th- I think I think mountain goat. I'm not totally sure if if it's that or wild sheep. I'd have to look. I, I don't know all the books out there. But anyway, that's that's the point. Uh, don't underestimate the power of a book because I know there's a lot of videos. For me, I I personally I like watching things. I like watching things on like YouTube or TV or something to learn. Um, but I also uh, absolutely love and and I highly recommend uh, reading these books because the book there there's something about reading that puts the information in your mind in like a different way and you might be surprised I hear a lot of people say oh no I learned better by watching something and and so for me personally I like that better but what I found is when I read it I interpret it different and it sticks in my mind a lot better and I think a lot of people would, would figure that out if they spent a little bit more time reading so these books are, are critical and a lot of this information like what you find in Mule Deer Country by Dr. Geist you're not going to find that on a YouTube video I'm sorry it's, it's just not out there this information that is is, is critical uh, to, to you understanding these animals. And so you, you could, you'll notice I'm spending a lot of time on uh, pounding home this, this, uh, this aspect of learning wild game and understanding wild game. Um, I hope you have like a pad of paper and a pen here because that is important. Learn behavior. Learn the food sources of that specific wild game. What a food source is for a mule deer is not going to be the exact same thing as what it is for a Rocky Mountain elk, right? It's not going to be the same thing for a white-tailed deer or a turkey or anything else that you're going after, especially like a pronghorn. Okay, food sources. Migrations. Learn the basics of animal migrations and learn breeding seasons, not just when they breed, but how they breed. Like the way the rut is for a Rocky Mountain elk is a a lot different than what a rut is for a white-tailed deer, even though a lot of uh, comparisons can be made if you're concluding like you know, you know between the two. You you can make the the statement that there's a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of differences, and that's what's important to understand. Um, it'll make you a better hunter. And then the part two of that, uh, or the part one of the part two of that, how to hunt. That's where we're going to kind of back up here. So how to hunt, that's going to be the fun part. Learning how to hunt is a lot of fun. And I'm still, so I've been doing it, guys. I, I turned 40 years old this past November. Um, I hate even admitting that, but I did, and I'm 40. I've been hunting. I, I first went on my, my first big game hunt with my dad when I was four. Um, and, and I have been hooked, addicted and, you know, borderline obsessed with hunting ever since the, the best way that you can educate yourself these days are because there's so many of them 
are are just by watching, reading, listening, having conversations, and using learning resources. Okay, in, in this day and age, we've got YouTube. When let's say you're somebody who wants to get into September archery elk hunting, go to YouTube, pull up uh, either the Bugler or uh, the Born and Raised Outdoors or or some series like that where they're that's specifically what they're doing, right? They're going out there, they're calling an elk within bow range, and they're they're putting an arrow in them. If th- those videos are more meant for kind of an entertainment side versus an educational side, but because they film those videos as a day by day series and go through m- much of the 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 stuff that that has gone through uh, or or showing what it takes to actually get an elk, they're really condensing a lot of that down. But you're going to be surprised as to what you learn by watching those videos. What kind of noises are they making? What kind of you know? And, and again, that's just for for the elk side of it. If if you want to, there's there's lots of these channels for um you know hunting whitetail or hunting mule deer or hunting bear. Uh, all there, it's all out there for bear. Uh, go track down the uh, gritty Brian Call and Ryan Lampers and watch their bear videos. They're freaking amazing, and it, it, I, I learned a lot watching those. I, in fact, I just watched those again like like a month ago or something. So anyway, really good stuff. Podcasts. Obviously, I'm a fan of podcasts, right? I got a podcast, and so. You uh, again, going back to September archery elk season. If you want to learn a lot about uh, uh, about how to hunt elk in September, go back to the Western Huntsman podcast. Uh, those those back episodes that say School of September. I've got some of the biggest names in elk hunting in that series, and they all give a little bit different take on on how they approach elk season, and they do a really good job of breaking down their strategies and their their game plans and, and how they're hunting these elk because they all get elk every single year and they're all worth listening to. So I would highly encourage you listening to the School of September. Now, is the Western Huntsman podcast the only place to listen? Nope. There's tons of really good content, or, or I'm sorry, podcasts out there with a lot of really good content that will teach you and work towards your goal of being successful as, as a hunter. So podcasts, free, YouTube, free, books, there's a lot of great hunting books out there. I, I know I brought up books when we were talking about learning the wild game and their behavior, food sources, migrations, and breeding seasons. But there's also a lot of good books just generally on how to hunt and or stories. There's there's this book, it, well, I want to call it The Crimson Arrow, and I can't remember who wrote it. But uh, I, I think I listened to that on like a book on tape or something. And, and I, I picked up a lot of information on how to hunt whitetail throughout the – like the, he – this guy that writes it, he's in the Midwest, but it would apply to mountain whitetails. It would apply to eastern whitetails. All, all of that information, the point that I'm trying to get at is is it was not written as an educational book. He's just telling stories. But as he's telling stories, he's telling you what he's doing, right? And so you pick up on that the, those little nuggets of information all along the way, and it's really good stuff. Um, I know like you get on uh, the meat eater, those guys have a lot of good books they've written. Uh, one of them, I'm trying to look at my bookshelf over there. One of them's called Hunting, Butchering, and Cooking Wild Game. You know, books like that, great information. They're not free like podcasts and YouTube, but they're worth it. They're, they they really are. Get those books and eat those books up. Uh, another, my, I have some friends that wrote a book called Team Bad Decisions, and they write about their backcountry hunting experiences all over the West, and a really entertaining book and really educational. Conversations, just having conversations with hunters. Pick up on information you get from hunters. That is going to be a key aspect of, of learning because these, these, these folks are going to have different opinions and different approaches as to how they go about hunting. And how there's and they're going to have different levels of success, and so that's what you want to pick up on. Um, and then I want to leave you with the education side of it, with the learning resources. Okay, specific to uh, I, obviously, if you guys have listened to the show, you know my my number one passion uh, when it comes to hunting is chasing elk in September when they're running uh, with a bow. That's that's what I love to do. Uh, I hunt, I hunt deer, I hunt both whitetail and mule deer. I hunt turkeys, I hunt bear, um, I hunt all sorts of different things. I've I've hunted boars, uh, you, you know, there, and, and tons of upland game and waterfowl. Basically, if you can get a tag to hunt it, I probably hunted it. That is not to say that I am great at hunting everything, because <laughs> I'm certainly not. 
but there are people that are, and a lot of them like to put these resources together. So getting back to this elk thing, we talked a lot about this in our hunt panel, elk, elk talk panel uh, that we did back in December and all through the school of September. But there's some really good resources that cost, uh, that, you know, they do require a little investment. But that is what I want to kind of hammer home to you new hunters Instead of going out and buying some crazy expensive pack that you don't know if that's going to be the right pack for you until you start hunting, spend the money on these types of resources. Some of these resources will talk about the gear and will help you kind of make better decisions on on the gear. Uh, Some of those resources are, if you're writing this down, uh, Blue Collar Elk Hunting. They have an online uh, class essentially on how to become a proficient elk hunter in September. Elk Calling Academy. That's my buddy Michael Batiste. He has a a Patreon where you could tune in every week and there's like question and answer forums and all sorts of information where he teaches you how to call elk to hunting scenarios and setups and everything else. The Elk Collective, that is a collective of great elk hunters where they'll talk everything from calling to uh, gear to uh, game cameras to, you know, whatever. It's just all there's tons of information on that. Uh, Row Hunting Resources is another great uh, program, and that is great for whitetail, elk, and turkeys. I don't think he's added anything since uh, the last time I checked that out, but if you want to learn how to call any of those or learn their behaviors, <clears throat> Chris Rowe, who runs it, is uh, an actual wildlife biologist, so it makes a lot of sense that he's got a class like this, so you, you'll get a lot out of that. There's also an app out there. I can't remember if it's 5 bucks or if it's 10 bucks, but there's an app, app called The Elk Nut. Uh, and that is where Paul Medell gets on and talks about calling elk in. Those are those are like my key resources when when somebody asks me uh, how how do I learn how to elk hunt? How do I how do I get better at, at chasing elk? And, and I don't care if it's in October for rifle season or muzzleloader in November or what, whenever those seasons are or archery elk season in September. They're all really good. They're all so good in and they're so full of information and they're worth the money. If you if you have the opportunity, make that investment. Do it. I mean, it, you'll, you won't regret it, I promise. <laughs> so, okay, let's shift gears now and talk about finding mentors. Mentors is is going to be, what, what you'll hear a lot is, oh yeah, we're going to uh, get you a mentor. And, and uh, th- that's what people recommend. What's your number one hunting advice? Well, find a mentor. That sounds super easy on the surface when it's said like that. But the reality is, is it is difficult to find a mentor with a seasoned hunting, uh, somebody who's seasoned at hunting that, that has had success and, uh, they want to be willing to take you in under, you know, their wing and kind of show you the ropes. A lot of people and a lot of, um, you know, hunters are, are a little worried. Okay. Well, is this individual going to steal my hunting spots or, you know, do I really want to take a new guy out or a new gal out or do I want to, and you'll find a lot of people are, they're more than happy to do that, but a lot of people aren't. And so it sounds a lot easier than it really is. And there's there's something that I recommend. What what a lot of people usually kind of get, when they're given this kind of tip to to a new hunter, oh go find a mentor. They're kind of talking about like you're going to find one mentor and latch onto that one person and try to learn how to hunt. That sounds great, and if you could do that, that's great. But what I re- what I would recommend instead of trying to find just one person, find a group of people. You know, have have one person that you talk to about something specific like elk hunting. Another person that you talk to who's a really good mountain whitetail hunter. That and guys, I, I told you, I'm I'm 40. I've been doing this for you know 30 what 36 years, and I still love having these mentor type conversations with people that are a lot better at hunting than I do. Than or I'm sorry, than I am. And so that's what I do. And I have lots of mentors. I don't just have one specific mentor. I have lots of mentors and I reach out to them and I'll, I'll send them an email and ask them, hey, what do you think about this? You got to know how to write, ask the right questions too. Don't send somebody an email or a message on Facebook and say, hey, where can I go hunting? Can you give me an area? You know, can you put me in front of a deer? Uh, that's, that's the inappropriate way to ask. Instead, ask questions like, what do you look for in a hunting area when you're hunting a whitetail? What do you look for? When you're going to a new area and you want to find elk in that area or turkeys or bear, you know, again, all this stuff is going to just relate to whatever game species you're, you're going after. So um, that's what that's what I recommend. 
and know how to ask the right questions. Why do you do it this way? Why, if they're, if, if you're fortunate enough that they take you out, the one thing that I learned from being a hunting mentor to somebody else was I don't know what they don't know, right? And I need to know what they don't know in order to answer the questions that they might have in their mind. So that what I'm trying to get at here is don't be afraid to ask questions. If you're fortunate enough, especially if, they, if they'll take you out, if they'll take you out to a spot and, and uh, take you deer hunting or something, you've ne- you never been. Don't be a shy. Don't be shy about asking questions. If he's like, okay, you go, you go sit over there. I'm going to go over here. Well, why? Why are you doing that? And not in a way that's questioning, you know, what what their thought process is, or, or you know, the the credibility they have, or anything like that. But why? Explain to me why we're going up this drainage at 9 a.m. Uh, why is it we need to back off this ridge at a certain time of day? Why these things, those are the things that you, you don't be shy about asking. Uh, that is going to really increase your competency. I'm going to give you a really good example. Uh, we had some family move up to our area, and and uh, one of them was really interested in going hunting. He'd never really been, he'd, he'd gone out a couple times with uh, with his family when he was a kid, and that, and that was it. Other than that, just didn't have any experience. And I was taking him out and took him out for a couple years, and uh, he was learning, but not like learning a bunch. And what I found was he was he was super dependent on me. I would just tell him, you know, you go down over there and sit behind that tree, or we're going to stop right here and call, or, or go over there. And there was not a lot of questions going on. And so what I, what I found out is he had tons of questions that maybe, I don't know if he was afraid to ask or just maybe thought he would ask them later when we weren't actively hunting and then forgot or or what. But then he started going out on his own. And his knowledge and his competency, uh, it really shot up when he started going out on his own. So when I when I talk about finding mentors, that mentor does not have to be somebody who's physically taking you out all the time and teaching you how to hunt, right? Because you can kind of get like a codependency or something, you know, built up on that where you you might not be learning that much because it's it's just more active hunting. You know, you don't want to have a bunch of conversations when you're hunting whitetail on a mountain, right? And so the the point to that is is getting back to uh, when he started going out on his own, I, I and then I would go with him later. I was I was pretty impressed with what he knew at that point because what he would do is he would go out there and he would come up with this question and that question would stick with him because he's on his own and then he would come out and he would find out. And so when you're looking for mentors, a mentor could be somebody that you just have email conversations with. You just have you know a text message uh, stream stream going back and forth. And and that's all. Uh, if if that's all it is, that's really good because then you can you could list out these questions. And when you get back um, and, and you're not in the field anymore, you can you could send a text message. Hey, I was walking up this drainage and noticed all the deer shot up the other side when I was still 500 yards away. What can you tell me about that? What what did I do? How did I screw that up? That's that is what I would consider a good solid mentor and somebody that would that would go ahead and walk through that with you, you know, through a text message or an email or something like that. It's it's really good. That that's the, and and if you have multiple people, you're going to get a lot of different opinions and you're going to kind of form your own way. Uh, that's kind of the point when I talked about if if you go back and, and we're talking elk hunting and you sign up for the blue collar elk hunting uh, academy and you sign up for the elk calling academy and the elk collective and row hunting resources and the elk nut app and you have all those and you go through all the information which that is just a ton you're talking about years and years and years of of uh, folks that have a lot of experience putting this information in front of you what you're going to be able to do is you're going to take some somebody is going to say something that you really like, and they're also going to say something that you feel like doesn't mesh well with your personality or your capability or whatever. But then the next, in the next uh, resource, maybe that's uh, the opposite. And so you're you're just taking this information from all these different resources, and you're molding your own hunting style and process into it. That's what I recommend. That's going to be a great way for you to learn. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind when you're when we're talking about these resources and finding mentors and and things like that. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Time in the field. The last but certainly not least, time in the field. When we're talking about time in the field, spending time in the field with or without a mentor is going to be a very key aspect to how competent you become and how quickly you become competent. Let me give you an example. Somebody who's getting into hunting that spends three weekends a year out in the field trying to hunt a deer, 
let's use deer as an example. Somebody who's never been, they've never been hunting, uh, they know very little about it, and they want to they wanna become a hunter. And they want that, you know, uh, fresh, wild game, organic meat in their freezer or whatever. Somebody who spends three weekends on the mountain a year is going to take many, many, many years to become a proficient and effective hunter. Now compare that to somebody who goes into the woods in the spring and just monitors deer. And then they go in the summer and watch the deer. They watch the deer herds. They monitor. They see where the fawns have dropped. They watch the does with the fawns. They do all these things where they're they're monitoring. And then come hunting season, they're dedicated. They spend, instead of three weekends, a total of three weeks in the field. How many years is it going to take for that individual to be on par with a proficient hunt, hunter versus the, the person that goes out for three weekends or three Saturdays even? Are you, are you smelling what, what I'm stepping in here? I, I hope you're smelling what I'm stepping in because the point is proficient hunters are not um, casual hobbyists. They are fully immersed in this lifestyle, and, and they should be. Spend time in the field even if it's outside of season. I'll give you an example uh, on that. So where I live, I, we've got we've got a few acres here in the woods. We have tons of white-tailed does and a few bucks running around too, uh, which are which are a lot of fun. But they never seem to drop their antlers on my property. It's really irritating. My neighbors always get them. <laughs> All right, side note. Okay, so I, I've got deer. I will uh, sometimes, I've got a... Uh, like a back deck where I can watch uh, the, kind of this open area in my yard and then and then a pretty pretty thick treed area. And if I'm just sitting back there nice and quiet, uh, it's not that they don't know I'm there, but they know that I'm not a threat. And so they just let me watch them. And I sit there and I watch them and I watch how they kind of communicate with each other with their feet or with little huffs and, and sounds or I, I, I see what makes their ears perk and their heads pop up. I see what they're feeding on. I see how they interact with the the yearlings or the fawns. I see how they react, how the does react when a buck shows up. I see all these different things, and I just sit and watch. You'd be amazed at what I pick up on, and you'd also be amazed at how proficient, how quickly I became a proficient whitetail hunter. I went from shooting one whitetail when I was like 20, and just because of uh, circumstantially, I was back east stationed with the military and, and hunted whitetail to now uh, I get one every year. And uh, and that's a, that's a new thing for me because, I've I, you know, when we're talking about deer hunting, I'm a fantastic mule deer hunter. I've spent a lot of time mule deer hunting, um, and, and that's what I grew up doing. Uh, I have had a lot of fun chasing mule deer, and, and really that's, that's one of my oldest passions. But I really got interested in these whitetail. And, and so, it, because they, they are a different animal to, to, to pursue in there, it's very satisfying. So I, that's one of the ways I became very proficient with whitetails. Now I can call whitetail bucks in. Uh, I know how to, I know how to call them in. I know how to, you know, set and, and not get winded. I, all these things. Anyway, I'm, I, again, I'm not trying to get into all that. Um, another thing I do, there's an elk farm locally here, uh, where in my neck of the woods where I live, and there's, there's a lot of these cross country. So, so, you know, that might be an opportunity for you, but sometimes I'll just go sit. And I'll watch the elk. And and just like the deer, I watch and monitor how they interact with each other. Another way to do this is go into the woods. Go into the woods. And again, it doesn't have to be during season. I go in the spring all the time. In fact, the spring is a great time to get up in the woods and find a position to sit and just watch. And watch the elk. The elk are going to be moving back up, right? They're coming out of their winter range. And, and monitor and, and see how they interact with each other. See what, what freaks them out. See what you can get away with. See if they, they vocalize at all. That's super interesting when you're, when you're sitting there in the spring and you've got this group, group of uh, cow elk moving up the drainage and they start talking to each other. But like the, the lead cow is in kind of a hurry and the, the, the others are kind of milling around in the bottom and, and she'll, start, she'll start mewing at them. And, and they'll start answering back, almost like they're arguing with each other. Like, I don't want to move that fast. No, you get your ass up here. <laughs> so it's, it's really interesting to watch, but you'd, you'd be just absolutely blown away with what you pick up on in terms of behavior. And uh, we talked about all those things that you want to know, right? The, the behavior, what they're eating, um, 
all the, the 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 migrations the breeding seasons we talked about all that uh, much of that you could learn on your own in any season of the year simply by locating them and monitoring them and watching them without them really knowing you're there or like i said when i'm in my yard it's they know i'm there but they know i'm not a threat uh because these these deer they you know this is where they live they they know and we've got a lot of neighbors and and they all do the same kind of thing so uh, I think that's a that's a really important thing. So watch the animals, listen to the animals, smell the animals, feel the feel the ground, feel the feel the, use your senses when you're in the woods. Learn to be a woodsman. Um, and I don't know how to say that. If 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 you're a female uh, woods girl or wh- whatever woodsman is just uh, male or female, learn some woodsmanship. Because that's that's critical, both for your, for knowing the animals and knowing how to how to traverse up and down the mountains, uh, but to all the way to you know understanding how to survive if things go bad. So be, becoming a good woodsman is is really a critical part of this, especially when we're talking about hunting the West. So understand the mountains of the West too. There's another point I want to bring up when we're talking about time in the field. You must know how mountains, you know, mountains are unique ecosystems. They're full of dynamic landscapes. Conditions can change on a dime. You've got to understand thermals. You've got to understand climate changes within the mountain systems and how one side could be so vastly different from the other to what's in the bottom of a drainage versus on top of a ridge. All the things you've got to know how to read a mountain. And and again, this is we're talking strictly to our Western hunters out here. And uh, there, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time in the back country. You know, they're they're backpackers or uh, you know whatever recreational activity you may have done in the past. That's going to help you because the more you understand about the mountains and the dynamics of a mountain and and those landscapes that are. Uh, I guess I, another key point, like mountains in Arizona are different than mountains in uh, Idaho, for example. Okay, uh, mountains in Wyoming are different than mountains in in uh, coastal Washington or Oregon. Uh, that's a that's an important thing to understand. But if you just know the basics of a mountain, you could take that knowledge and apply it to any western state that you're hunting. So that is a really cool part of it. Know your mountains. Know thermals. Thermals just on a basic level, guys. Uh, when when you're talking thermals, you know, uh, air air warms up, it goes up, right? What goes up must come down. So when it starts cooling off, the air comes back down. So the, 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 the point to that is, uh, you know, in the morning, thermals are coming down. Midday, thermals are usually going up. You can usually not even barely even notice them. You might feel a little whisper on the side of your face with thermals. Sometimes you don't notice anything at all. Uh, and then as the sun starts setting again, the air starts cooling down, those thermals shift again and they go back down. Uh, I have tons of stuff. If you get on the, the westernhuntsman.com and go to the articles tab and scroll way down, I have a whole article specific to thermals and it's super, super thorough. Uh, so feel free to jump on there and check that out. And lastly, guys, what uh, we, we, covered, we covered the three pillars, the three main things that I think you need to work on. Educating yourself. And, and when we say educating, we are talking about both on the actual physical hunting aspect and also learning wild game, knowing how wild game, you know, behavior, food sources, migrations, breeding seasons, those things. OK, know those things. Tons of resources out there. Properly using mentorship and and having mentors and and the the importance of knowing when it's appropriate to follow the mentor versus going out on your own and and learning on your own because don't underestimate your own ability to learn some of these things on your own when you're in the mountains alone there you'll learn more than any other time that that you'll be out there and then lastly uh time in the field which is going to kind of wrap up with your woodsmanship and knowing the mountains and thermals and and uh, and things like that. Just being out in the field is is just amazing. It's 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 so educational in itself that I highly highly encourage it. There there we go. That was the three educational pillars. So hopefully that makes sense. If you guys have any questions on those and you want me to expand on those, feel free to use me as a mentor. Shoot me a message at jim at thewesternhuntsman.com. I do get a lot of emails, so you know bear with me. I'll I'll get to you eventually. <laughs> so sometimes it just takes a while. And then I just want to wrap it up with, you know, if you are if you are serious and, and you're you really do want to be a hunter and you want to be a proficient hunter and, and competent and, and able to provide and and kind of satisfy some of those, uh, you know, primal humanistic urges that, that hunting brings out in us. Make sure you are a good steward to the hunting community. 
there was a video running around last fall of some younger guys that had uh, hung a deer in their garage and poured beer down its throat and and uh, were, were chugging it out of the mouth of the deer. That's disturbing stuff, and it really does represent hunters in a very negative light. And so my my advice to you on that is hunting as hunters, we are not the majority, and we are threatened. We just went through this big legislative battle in California where they were trying to flat out ban bear hunting based on emotions and no uh, there's there's no science involved. We're in a we're in a place where much wildlife management is being passed through the ballot box versus the actual science and the and the people we hire and train to be wildlife managers. There's a lot of misinformation and anti-hunting organizations that are fighting against us to to make sure these rights are uh, they're they're plummeted and they're and they're taken away from us. There's politicians that want to turn public lands into privately owned lands or state-owned lands, which will then turn into privately owned lands. Uh, there there's people that just don't understand the the science behind wildlife management that think that hunting is bad. Guys, the facts are not on their side. But the numbers are on their side. And so when I say things like don't do beer bongs out of a deer esophagus and put it on freaking Facebook, I mean that from the bottom of my heart and and from a place that if we want a future as hunters and and we want a future with this lifestyle, I cannot stress enough how we must promote our hunting lifestyle in a very positive way. Don't disrespect those animals like that. Don't hang your your coyotes. There, that was another thing that I saw recently. They they trapped coyotes and then hung them from the back of their jeep and drove down the highway. What do you think happens when anti hunters see something like that? That is not that is not carrying the torch for our next for the next generation. That's going to ruin hunting. That kind of stuff will ruin hunting for us in the future. We just have to be respectful. We have to be tasteful when we're sharing our hunting experiences and, and help people understand that are non-hunters that, uh, you know, maybe they're not anti-hunters, but they're not really hunters either. They're, they're just kind of there and, and they're open to either way. Help educate those kind of people and, and make them understand that this, this is the lifestyle that made it so that our almost extinct elk herds across North America are now thriving. We, we had very few white-tailed deer left and turkeys that were almost extinct in North America. All those species are now thriving. That did not come about from anti-hunting organizations. That came about through hunting. The facts are there. Know that kind of information. We have lots of information on this show in past episodes about that and how, how you can learn uh, why it's important, why that management is, pertains to hunting, and how hunting benefits our wildlife. And that's it. That's what I got for you guys. I hope you got something out of this episode. Um, Again, this is just a bonus episode. It's always kind of weird for me when I don't have a guest and I just kind of go rambling on. But uh, I know it was uh, it was fast. uh, But there was, I I think, a lot of information out there that maybe doesn't get communicated a lot when people are just trying to ask simple ask simple questions. But now you at least have a guide and focus on on what I laid out for you. That's an outline as to how to become an effective, proficient, competent, and well stewarded hunter. I don't know if that's a word. Well stewarded. <laughs> you guys look it up and let me know, right? So the outline is, uh, you know, it, it's 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 a really simple map to follow, and it will get you to where you want to go. Educate yourself, find mentors, and spend time in the field. With that, guys, have a fantastic week. Reach out to me at jimatthewesternhuntsman.com. Follow us on Instagram at the Western Huntsman and on Facebook at the Western Huntsman, and join the group on Facebook, Hunting the West. Dash the Western Huntsman, and we'll see you at one of those spaces. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. You made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We sure appreciate your support. This is Jim Huntsman signing off and reminding you to check us out at Instagram at The Western Huntsman and on Facebook at The Western Huntsman. And you can also check out the website at thewesternhuntsman.com. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.